Hi, my name is Joe Saint, and today we're going to be talking about some of the theories of intelligence that ultimately led us to what we now know as Cattell Horn Carroll or CHC theory of intelligence. So, around the late 1920s, Charles Spearman began to realize that children's grades were pretty much correlated across class settings meaning that if a child was doing well in one subject, he was more likely to do well in other subjects as well. And the, the reverse is true as well. If a student was doing poorly in one subject, they were more likely to, that student was more likely to be doing poorly in another subject. Um, from this, he eventually began to think that there was an underlying general mental ability that played a part for all kinds of mental tests that students could take. And at that point, it's important to remember that these were still mental tests. We didn't really have IQ tests yet. Not in the classic form, not in what we view as IQ at least. So ultimately, he came up with G, which is the lowercase, normally italicized G, standing for the general factor. Um, this G was a latent and hidden trait that was unobservable. Um, and from that, you could measure G with individual tests. So when we look at the outline, the graphic over here on the right-hand side, we see that G is leading towards boxes with T in it. So this is the factor analytic way to show that G is measured by each of these. So T stands for test. Um, this G factor can also sometimes called the psychometric G. It was one of the first mathematically defined factors, and it was the first mathematically defined general factor. Um, and it was it was this shared variance between multiple batteries of tests of cognitive and intellectual ability. Um, and it was that shared variance that ended up making up what he believed to be G. Jensen in 1998 summarized most of the literature around this to say that um, the correlates of G are wide ranging, but some of the major correlates are academic achievement, reaction time, success in training programs, job performance in a wide range of occupations, general occupational skills, occupational status, income, um, income, creativity. There was just so many things that correlated with general intelligence or this general factor that was researched. Um, it wasn't without its... Mm -mm, I guess I should say it wasn't without its critics. So Thorndike, Godfrey Thompson, Thompson, I think, yeah, Thompson, um, L. Kelly, Thurston, Thurstone, which we'll talk more about Thurston in a minute. Um, but they were all pretty big critics of Spearman's G. Interestingly, Alfred Binet eventually embraced the general factor in um, 1909. He wrote, the mind is unitary despite the multiplicity of its facilities. It possesses one essential function to which all others are subordinate. And that was just him accepting that G was a thing and that it was that general ability. Now we're going to talk about Louis L. Thurston. Um, he lived from 1887 to 1955. And he did a couple really cool things. Um, one of the first things that he did was he developed, he further developed um, part of a branch of statistics to prove his points. And that kind of all, that kind of tenacity just really gets me. So he helped develop, well, realistically, he developed the multiple factor analysis techniques that we use today, really to prove his multiple factor theory of intelligence. So Thurston believed that um, there were multiple PMAs, so these are primary mental abilities, yeah, primary mental abilities, and that there were multiple PMAs, and that they were all 
inextricably linked in some capacity. That's why you see the arrows going from each of them to each other. And that underneath these PMAs, they could all be tested with standardized assessments. Interestingly, he came to this um, after a couple really, really large studies that he conducted. So one of them was in 1938. He gave a battery of 56 paper and pencil tests to each of four, I'm sorry, of 240, and this is in quotation, superior college students. And from that, he used his factor and analytic technique and came up with seven factors of intelligence. So those were spatial visual, perception of visual detail, three numerical, four logic verbal. Um, the fifth one was words verbal. So that's like semantics and vocabulary, whereas logic verbal was more like similarities on the whisk. Um, the sixth was memory and the seventh was induction and then like a few years later so the first one was 1938 the next one was 1945 thurston and thurston conducted another study with 714 year olds and each of those 700 students were administered 60 tests um, and those were done across 11 sessions lasting one hour each Ultimately, they found six factors. So this time they found verbal comprehension, verbal fluency, space, number, memorizing, and reasoning and induction. And interestingly, around this time, Thurston began to accept the general, the general factor of intelligence, but he still continued to argue that a single IQ wasn't adequate and urged others to use cognitive profiles. So that part's pretty interesting to me simply because I work in schools and that belief of, um, of cognitive profiles, so not just the overall cognitive ability, but looking at individual psychological processing and looking for a pattern of strengths and weaknesses is a lot of what we do in schools, specifically that is part of the federal and Georgia definition for a specific learning disability, is that the student has a pattern of a um, yeah, a pattern of psychological strengths and weaknesses. So now we've got Philip Vernon, who was born 1905, died 1987. Vernon is, his theory is kind of interesting. So his was the first truly hierarchical model of intelligence. And that's why it's included here, because he was that, that intermediate step that many people forget about. Um, in, his, in his theory, you had the general G, and then you had the two you only had two factors underneath it. So what Thurston called PMAs, Vernon's was VED and KM, where VED was verbal educational and KM was, sp was spatial mechanical. So these were kind of his general, not general, but more of his stratum two levels. And there were traits that fell underneath that and there were, there were many, many, many traits. He didn't really define how many. He just said they were a lot. And all of the traits he believed fell under one of those two, either verbal educational or spatial mechanical. So this last theory we need to talk about is the GCGF theory. This was right around the 1940s and it's really the last iteration before CHC theory really found its foothold. And CHC theory ended up being a mixture of Vernon's hierarchical model along with the GCGF model. So let's talk about this. Um, the first thing we need to notice is that there's no G. There's no general factor of intelligence here. Um, and that was because GF kind of substituted in as G. It, under this belief, GF and GC were very, very, very related and that there were no other primary abilities that related to intelligence as heavily. 
So let's talk about what each of these mean. GC is cultural knowledge, and it's called crystallized intelligence. But it's ultimately cultural knowledge that you gain from your experiences, whereas GF is fluid reasoning and that ability to logic critically through unknown situations. And the fact that the situations are unknown or that bare minimum you have no prior knowledge of them or no prior knowledge that relates to them is important to this definition of GF. But that belief is why there's an arrow going from GF to GC. So in this, belief, in this theory, GF, your fluid reasoning ability, directly impacts your crystallized knowledge abilities. And so those with lower GF are less likely to have high GC. But the opposite under this theory isn't necessarily true. Another thing that's really important to understand about this theory is this is the first one where there was kind of an understanding of construct irrelevant variance and that most tests have it. So when you look at the other models that we've talked about today, they all have one arrow going from one of either the primary ability, the PMA or G, to a test. Whereas this one has an arrow going from each of the two abilities, GC and GF, to each of the tests. And that's because in this theory, the two are so linked that you can't really pull them apart. But also that means that you can't pull them apart when you're testing for them and looking for them. Here we have the final iteration. This is the CHC theory or the cattell horn carroll theory of intelligence. And this was from where Carroll took all of these previous theories and a bunch more that we didn't have time to talk about today. And he really combined them using the research that had already been conducted into this theory. And since this, because this theory was published in 93, and since that time, there have been numerous studies that have either confirmed or tweaked this theory to help move it forward. But overall, this theory is the most research-driven, using empirical data at least, of the theories of intelligence. So G is still your general factor, and that's your overall intelligence. GF and GC are the same that we've talked about. GLR is long-term storage and retrieval and efficiency. Um, GSM is short-term memory, GV is visual perceptual, um, GS is processing speed, and GA is auditory perception. And you see this big box down here that says multiple narrow abilities for each broad. So these Gs are your broad abilities, and each one of them will have multiple narrow abilities within them. So one of the ones under GLR is what's called meaningful memory or associative memory. And that's that ability to actually learn and associate new material. But also under GLR is learning efficiency, which is how quickly you can do that. Um, how quickly you can pull something from the depths of your memory. So this has been a very brief overview of the history of CHC theory and how it came about. Thank you for listening to my 10-ish minutes of history.